going to draw over here a neural tube with the neural canal in the middle. And then we're going to put flanking either side are these neural crest cells. And then these really big structures off to the periphery are these somites. So here we've got neural tube, neural crest, and over here are somites. Okay, and somites have the following components to them. They are comprised of a sclerotomal element that's here in the midline, and these sclerotomal elements are the ones that are going to be producing uh, the vertebra uh, that surround the neural tube and make the vertebrae. We also then have more on the periphery these dermatomes, and the dermatomes are the component that's going to be making the dermis of the skin. Uh, and it's only the skin of the back, but because the lateral plate mesoderm is going to do the rest of it, but the principle is going to be the same. And then in the midline, we have the myotome. I'm going to use the letter M to represent the myotome. And the myotome is really comprised of two different structures. It's made of the dorsally located um, epimere and the ventrally located hypomere. And these structures, the epimere forms the back muscles and the hypomere forms the body wall and the limb muscles. And together these make somites. And we have approximately 33, let me do that again. We have approximately 33 different somites. Uh, 33 somites in the body, 8 cervical somites, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and then 3 coccygeal that we're not going to worry about. But there we've got this formation. So what I'm going to do now is demonstrate that up here is where the back is located in this illustration. And down here is where the body wall is located and the limbs. And why am I doing that? Whoops, pardon me. Why am I doing that? Because we see that each of these migrating dermis and myotomal segments are going to contribute elements to the back and to the body wall and to the limbs. So let's do the following. I'm just going to then uh, uh, kind of erase out part of these segments because we're going to see them, uh, we're going to see some migration of cells that every, we're going to see the back, there's going to be a dermatomal component. We're going to see a, a dermatomal component and a myotomal component. Myotome, dermatome. And then we're going to also see down here a dermatomal component and a myotomal component of these cells that are going to migrate. So let's take a look at the migrating skin cells first. That We've got all these skins, some of the these dermal cells are going to migrate all the way to the back. And then some of these are going to migrate all the way to the front body wall and also to the limbs. And the, these migrating cells fill this gap and it makes this belt on one side of skin, of the dermis. How I, what I do also want to show for this is the following is that you've got s nerves that follow. So in these neural crest cells are these cells, and there's the cell bodies are going to form the sensory bodies of the pseudounipolar neurons or the dorsal root ganglion. And there's going to be a process that sends to the alar plate of the neural tube, and the dorsal horn gray matter, and then another process that comes all the way out and courses to the dermis of the back. But then another branch is going to go forward and follow uh, the dermis that goes to the dermis of the body wall and in the cervical lumbar sacral region, the limbs. Now observe the following. We also see this migration of these epimere cells that go and then they form along the back uh, vertebrae and then these hypomere cells that migrate ventrally and they're going to form the hypaxial body wall muscles like your obliques and intercostals and your limb muscles in the cervical region. So upper limb in the cervical, lumbosacral region for lower limb muscles. And these migrating cells form those bands of muscles. 
So appropriately, what we see is that as we've got these cell bodies, these ventral horn cells that are forming the basal plate, they send out these axonal processes that fuse with uh, the axonal process from our uh, neural crest cells. And then you've got some of these fibers that follow the epaxial muscles and some of these fibers that follow the hypaxial muscles. So early anatomists then took a look at these, which are showing the dorsal branch of the spinal nerve going to the skin of the back and the back muscles, and the term for branch is ramus. And they took a look at these two together, and there's uh, a branch that goes to the hypaxial limb muscles or the skin of the body wall or the limbs, and it's the front branch or ventral ramus that come together. Um, and so finally, we've got this migration of these sclerotomal cells. That some migrate to the front and some to the back of the neural tube, and they form a vertebral element in that segment. So every one of these 33 semitic segments have a spinal cord segment that's surrounded by a vertebral element that has spinal nerves associated with the myotomal and dermatomal component, both on the front and the back. Observe, we have a vertebral element, a spinal cord element, it's number two, and a spinal nerve element. So let's write that down here. One, vertebral element, two, spinal cord element, and three, spinal nerve element. And let's draw this out now in an adult fashion where we've got the spinous process of some type of a vertebra, and then there's our transverse process, and another transverse process. And then in the vertebral foramen, we've got this spinal cord where there's dorsal horn gray matter and then there's ventral horn gray matter and more ventrally located is this vertebral body. I've exaggerated this a wee bit but you get the picture. And then we've got a dorsal root coming together with a ventral root and then coming off that spinal nerve trunk is a dorsal ramus and a thicker ventral ramus and on that dorsal root is those Neural crest cells make the dorsal root ganglion. And so here again is the back, and here again down is the body wall and the limbs. And each of these has a dermatomal and a myotomal component, a dermatomal and a myotomal component. So every segmental level, we have a vertebral, a spinal cord, and a spinal nerve level with dermatomes and myotomes to consider. This happens 33 times. And so we think, all right, so what are some of the uh, examples of the body we've got? Well, there are, pardon me, uh, there and there. So we've got cervical, and there's seven cervical vertebrae, eight cervical spinal cord and spinal nerve levels. And what about the others? So what about thoracic? Well, in the thoracic region, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae with 12 spinal cord and spinal nerve levels. Well, what about the lumbar region? Well, the lumbar region, we have five lumbar vertebrae with five lumbar sacral cord and nerve levels. And finally, sacral, there is five few sacral vertebrae and then five sacral spinal cord with five sacral spinal nerve levels. And here we have a view of each of these somites from top to bottom, all following this exact same pattern. So we're going to do this one more time, except we're going to take a sagittal section right through this midline of the spinal cord, spinal nerves, and through the pedicle, which is the part of the vertebrae, the super and infra-adjacent pedicles form that neural foramen where the nerves exit. At this point, we're about halfway through. Stand up, shake it out. Uh, Go maybe get a drink, go see a man about a horse, uh, stretch, stretch, and then we're going to now draw uh, in more detail over here this coronal section. So to start, we're going to draw the base of the occipital bone like this and the base of the occipital bone over here like this, and you've got that uh, jug, uh, pardon me, frame and magnum in the middle. And we're going to start with forming our vertebral column. And so we need to then take a look and say, all right, let's see how many. We need seven cervical vertebrae. So we need C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. Now I could do the same on the other side to show the other pedicle, but it gets messy. So I'm just not going to do that. Uh, let's take a look now. We need 12 thoracic vertebrae. So T1, 
2, 3, 4, 5, T6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And now we need five lumbar vertebrae. So we now have L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I spread these out a bit more because the lumbar vertebrae get much thicker in the bottom region. And then S1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So there we've got, um, I'm going to actually back up a bit more because I'm running out of, it, it disappears to foam. There we go. Okay. Um, and what I might do just to make sure I can see everything. Okay. Um, now, let's draw out our spinal cord. So the spinal cord is going to be found in this vertebral canal. That's next. And to do that, I start drawing this out. And you, we don't go all the way to the bottom because remember the spinal cord ends at the between the L1 and L2 levels. So I stop there. And so this spinal cord really is composed of ends between L1 and L2 vertebral levels. Therefore, the cervical cord, it courses close to the region of its associated cervical vertebrae. This thoracic spinal cord level only goes around three quarters of the way down its associated uh, vertebrae. And then we split the difference between the lumbar and sacral. And this is approximate, but it's pretty close. So that when we look at... Um, the, the, these different levels. We see cervical cord level, and then we see thoracic cord level, and then we see lumbar cord level, and then finally our sacral cord level. And there we've got cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Recognize that there that there is equal segments, but there is this vertebral segmental discrepancy and how the sacral region ends. The lumbar and sacral regions are kind of squished together down here at the bottom. And now that we've got vertebral, pardon me, so now that we've got our vertebral levels and our spinal cord levels, let's talk about our spinal nerve levels. Let's take the color yellow. And each level, so the C1 spinal cord level, is going to course above the C1 vertebrae. And I tell you, this thing kind of bugs me because everything else follows a pattern and it seems the cervical doesn't, but it does. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in this base of the occipital bone the color orange because each of these migrating sclerotomes forms a cranial and a caudal end and the first somite fuses on the base of the occipital bone so that when the C1 nerve courses, it does course under its associated um, vertebra but that part of the vertebra is fused to the occipital bone, so the occipital bone really is C1. We just didn't name it that. So if you want to put like a little 8 over here in brackets, because there really is 8 cervical vertebrae, we just got it wrong. Uh, early anatomists got it wrong. So vertebral levels, spinal cord levels, and then here's our spinal nerve levels. And let's draw the remainder of these. So there's C1, and there's C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and then there is C8. And we change over to thoracic 1 and T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, T8, T9. You're starting to notice something. T10, T11, T12. Is that these nerves are starting as we descend down the spinal cord. Instead of coursing horizontally, in the vertebral canal, we're starting to know these rootlets are now starting to course vertically in this um, in the uh, vertebral canal. Until we get down to the sacral region, there's S1, the rootlets are completely coursing in this fashion. And I re I'm very sorry that S5 um, got cut off here at the bottom of the screen. That's my poor planning on my behalf. When early anatomists looked at this, they say, hey, all these rootlets in the bottom below the L2 vertebral column, together they look like a horse's tail. So they called it the cauda equina, which means tail of the horse. 
Now we see these uh, cervical thoracic coursing horizontally and the lumbosacral coursing more vertically. There's one of the unique differences to how these rootlets and their associated nerves exit. Uh, something to notice is that the dorsal and ventral roots, they form a spinal nerve trunk, but the forming of the spinal nerve trunk does not happen until the neural foramen. So all of these lines that are in this vertebral column, uh, vertebral canal, are actually roots that they will infuse at this neural foramen to become the spinal nerve trunk and the dorsal ventral ramus branch at that region. So in conclusion, let's take a look and put this all together. At each of these levels, so if we take a look at the C5 nerve that exits, it has a dermatomal and a myotomal component. The dermatomal component is the skin over the lateral shoulder for example, overlying the deltoid. And the muscle is primarily the muscles that abduct the glenohumeral joint. So that if we were to find the C5 somite, the dermis of the C5 doma, uh, the dermatome of that C5 somite forms in the, the dermis of the skin overlying the deltoid. And the myotomal component are those muscles that abduct the glenohumeral joint like deltoid and supraspinatus. We, we see, let's do another one in the cervical region. Let's take a look at the C8. The dermatome is the skin overlying the pinky. And the myotome are muscles that will flex the wrist, like the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, uh, FDS, FDP, these muscles that will flex the wrist, the C8 myotome, will then migrate and form those muscles. Let's see another one. Let's take a look at uh, L5, okay? So L5 coming down. There's a dermatomal and a myotomal component. The dermatomal component is the skin overlying the dorsum of the foot, the skin of the foot that touches your shoelaces, and the myotomal component are those muscles that are going to dorsiflex the ankle, like tib anterior, extensor halsus longus, extensor digitorum longus muscles. Um, we look at the now migration of that S1 somite, and the dermatomal component of that is going to be the skin overlying the heel or your cal, um, the skin uh, overlying the calcaneus. Cal Caneus. And the myotomal component are those that are going to plantar flex the ankle, like your uh, gastroc and soleus muscles. And now we can see this drawing out. There are numerous different uh, dermatomes and myotomes, but they all follow this exact same pattern. Always follow the same pattern, forming a sclerotomal or vertebral component, number one, that surrounds the spinal cord segment, its associated one, number two, which then has these nerves that come off at that level to form myotomes and dermatomes through the dorsal and ventral ramus. And if you know that pattern, it makes understanding this diagram a whole lot simpler.